Greetings friends, it's Alexa again with another dev stream and this time we have actually five leaks. Two of them from this stream and three from the other Tom Potter stream from the great Aaron and the, Aaron and the Frosty Leroux. Um, check out the podcast, it was the first episode I believe um, with Mike and he leaked three more things and I'm just going to put it in here as well because this is just a conglomeration of all the leaks we get so far or from what we get. And there's a bunch of interesting things also that were mentioned here. So let's just, as always, dive right in. All right. Will the meta be mostly the same for 1.1, or is there a good shakeup? Uh, it's it's tricky to know exactly what's going to happen. Um, Playstyles that people have shown us they really enjoy. Um, we're, we're we're careful not to decimate them completely into the ground type thing compared to the other things that are available. That there's like there are there are some very heavy nerfs on the like situations where people are getting into where they're wildly overpowered. Um, but you know, relative to the other builds that are available and the, and the maximum potential as a character you have in the game, it's pretty similar uh, for, for those super high builds. They're still high up builds. I think you're going to see more newcomers into the scene as far as builds go. Um, that that will, I guess, shade things up by just giving more options. So more newcomers. So basically, Forge will be good again, finally, <laughs> as a newcomer. No, the idea is really. Um, I put this in because he said heavy nerfs are coming and I found that to be interesting because um, this sort of is in line with what people said, what he said before that super high corruption is going to be not going to be a thing anymore unless it's a bug or anything um, because again, the game is balanced around 300 corruption, um, sort of the balancing, of course you can go higher and it's also intended you can go to like 500, 600. Now pushing any higher than that, he always keeps referring to the 4K, a uh, four-digit corruption is not intended to happen at all in the game. So, and right now we see builds go to like 4K sometimes even. So this will come down a lot. They will get the nerf hammer heavily. And um, so I think that's great because that, that gives the possibility for other builds to be good on the same level. Like for example, the other day I posted a, uh, a build about Thor, right? The Thor build for the mage, which is like the meteor with the um, with the thunderstorm instead. And this build is worse than the static orb sorcerer build, right? But it doesn't mean that it's not fun and that you can't do most of the most of the content that is in the game. So I think this is great because it gives more possibility for fun builds even of just for not as good builds right now to be good enough to do the content. So this is very healthy for the game. Gives more variety into um, the builds that are possible, more classes being played, more masteries being played, more replayability for people because they can try other builds instead of just the overpowered healing hands builds, right? So I think this is great. So this is why I wanted to throw this in. How do you guys feel about adding something to Necromancer to encourage some interaction on the part of the player rather than being completely passive? The, 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 the primary action we want players doing as playing a Necromancer in like driving into that primary theme they have is summoning things um so that that active summoning action um and so two two summoning skills that we have uh, included specifically to keep players um give players the option for being an active summoner where you're not just watching your minions kill things are um volatile zombie and summon wraith now this goes back to the efficiency thing a little bit i think is that it's really efficient to automate things. And um, so like we, we, and we like to give players options to do things that they find fun. So there are lots of options for automating things like Wraith with the new uh, Wraith Lord Helmet. And the, the, some, of the, some of those may be just a little bit too strong, I think, right now. So it makes doing it manually less appealing. So this is very interesting because for a bunch of things, also with Perfect XL2, but first of all, I want to say that the Rev Lord isn't really... Because the build with the Rev Lord revolves around summoning Volatile Zombies and like the, the top build for it, right? You have to summon your Volatile Zombies, he gobbles them up. If you do it with the Jungle Queen's belt, you sort of have to do something first to set up the damage. So uh, that doesn't really apply to what he said. I guess it just didn't come out the way they intended to. But it's interesting he said that they always want to have the summoning the main feature of the Necromancer. Because I was recently reacting to the Path of Exile 2 Necromancer trailer and I 
love the fact that I don't have to summon the minions all the time. <laughs> and especially because I was recently also playing in last epoch a frost um, archer build, like the summon skeleton archer build, and they just die all the time. So we are constantly just busy looking in the top left screen how many of these you of how many of your skeletons you have left, and you have to resummon them all the time. To me, this was annoying. <laughs> I didn't like that playstyle at all. Um, like it's not bad, it doesn't piss me off, but it's like I enjoy much more the fact or the direction that Perfect Exile 2 went that the minions are auto-summoned. When they die, they are summoned when there isn't some, some damage coming in. They are auto-summoned. So I can do other things. I can apply debuffs. I can cast buffs. I can even cast, I don't know, traps on the ground or whatever. Or some sort of pits. Whatever the fuck. I can... Like, this opens up a lot more possibilities if the minions are auto-summoned and I can focus on other things to actually have an active playstyle. Because right now, if we're being honest... Unless you go for the Archer build, if you go for the Golem, the Wrath Lord, or even just Wraths, you go for the Mages, you never actually summon your minions because they survive everything, right? So you, what you do with the Necromancer right now in Last Epoch, most of the times, is just kiting around and avoiding damage while your minions do everything. Right now, the Necromancer in Last Epoch is pretty boring to play because you're just not doing anything, right? Except maybe uh, sometimes applying Dreadshade every 18 seconds or whatever. So, and I have to have the minion summon skill on the bar, otherwise they vanish. So I can't even use other skills on my bar then. So this is just, uh, this is a problem. And Perfect Exile 2 is solving the problem pretty well. And I wonder what Less Epoch will do, or 11th hour games with that. Um, by the sounds of it, the idea is to just have... Or you just have to summon them more as sort of the idea with it. I don't like that too much. Um, so we'll see what happens to the Necromancer. Maybe maybe you like it. Let me know in the comments if you actually like the fact that you have to resummon your minions all the time. And I'm talking smack. Or like my my opinion is weird. Let me know what you think of that. But I just wanted to put this in because that's interesting that the idea really is that summoning the minions is the, the core feature of the Necromancer. For a less epoch, that is. Uh, how will the cycle stash tabs transferred into Legacy when the cycle ends? For example, I have 130 stash tabs in cycle and 80 in Legacy. How does it work next to the game? Okay, here's how it's gonna work. Um, you will when you open when you when you open uh, cycle rolls over. All of your characters are now Legacy. Okay, all of your characters are now Legacy. You have no cycle characters at all. Um, if you make a new cycle character, you open your cycle stash and it looks it's one it's general with one tab. That's your entire stash on cycle. Okay. You go into any other legacy character and you will see your legacy stash just like you see it now normally. I wanted to put this in because people have asked about this. Very interesting. You will you will sort of be able to switch between your cycle and legacy um, stash tabs in a drop down and you can move all the cycle items into your legacy but it's remove only and like you can only put it in there into legacy you cannot put it in the other way around or whatever so um i mean we knew this was going to happen the stash tabs stash tabs you bought in cycle will not transfer over right so if you're running out of space in legacy you will have to buy more stash tabs in legacy these do not transfer over we know that but it's not i think it's not bad not bad not a bad system otherwise you end up with millions of stash tabs um so i like it just wanted to put this in here all right, here's the first teaser, leak, whatever you want to call it. That is for the Forge God, Champion of the Forge. You have increased critical strike chance while wielding a two-handed weapon. Um, so 10% per point, so that's 8 points. That makes for 80% crit chance with two-handers. And the five-point bonus, you crit steal more damage per point of strength while wielding a two-handed weapon. So basically the crit multi per two strength. Um, so that's great. Also more two-hander, because I've said before that two-handers are really bad right now in the game in most cases because you lose four affixes, if you think about it. If you have a two-handed weapon, you cannot use your offhand, which would could have which could have four extra affixes you could throw stuff on. So you lose that, so the two-handers have to be much better than one-handers, otherwise you lose these four affixes, so this is kind of a trade-off for having a two-hander. And right now this isn't really the case, I think. 
So that's good. There's a lot for the Forge Guard, which I don't care about at all. I will be honest with you guys, because I don't play this ever. I don't care about that. <laughs> I'm a I'm a caster player. I play Mage and Necromancer. But there's a lot happening for the Forge Guard, and this has become a, um, become a meme, right? That it sucks. So <laughs> good to see they're addressing this. Second teaser, again, for the Circle of Fortune. Rank 7 is now double experimental items. Excited Mage has dropped twice as many experimental items um, once you reach that level. That is great. The great thing is, uh, this is really only good, I think, especially if you like into the, going into the future with new cycles, right? Because in your legacy, once this is filled up with like free stash, have sort of experimental experimental items, you don't really need that. But in new cycles, leveling to level seven and then getting more experimental items, so you can make better slams, get better items for your builds. That is great. So I like this. It's not really going to be useful in like legacy gameplay, but for the cycles, definitely a great, great new thing. Right. As I said, this is now from the podcast with Aaron over here and Frosty LaRue. The first podcast they had. This is another league, so I wanted to put it in here as well. But definitely check out their full podcast. It was very interesting to watch. So the first one is Indomitable Force for um, the Sentinel, obviously. Shield Bash has added melee damage based on your block effectiveness. Damage per 30 block effectiveness, 1 per point. So this is great. You basically gain more damage per more block. So you have to focus on your defense and resistance in this case, or like block effectiveness, but you also gain damage from that. This is great because um, you saw it always kind of in between going on damage and effect, or like defense. And with this case, or with this new, new node for the shield bash, you get both. All right, there's another leak. Incinerating Aura. You fire auras from all sources, deal damage in a large area. This gives you intelligence and increased fire aura area. Aura area, that's that's a tough one. Five point bonus, you fire auras from all sources, deal additional spell damage for two points of intelligence. But this is for the mage, obviously. Um, there is a currently a fire aura build. I've only seen one, though, really, with the, the white mage. Things. This is going to be interesting. Makes the aura much better, so we can maybe even make the our fire aura sorcerer, white damage sorcerer better. Maybe we'll see how this plays out. Uh, so let me know what you think of that. It doesn't seem to be too strong. I mean, you get it with over 100% increased fire aura, so maybe that's not bad. I don't know. Um, actually, never mind. For spell damage per, per two intelligence. So you can get this up to like 50 extra spell damage. That can be quite nice. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how it does. It's always always tough to, to rate this just by reading it. You have to play it. But let me know what you think of that. All right, another teaser. I somehow missed this because this was on, on X. Uh, I kind of missed this somehow, but whatever. This is Eternal Form. This is for the Void Knight, right? It's very interesting. You can put 10 points into this. Vitality, one per point. That's great because Vitality, as you know, also gives you Poison Resistance and Necro Resistance. And increased health, that is a percentage increase, 2% per point, which is crazy. So that gives you 20% increased health, so you can get really tanky. And 5-point bonus, you have additional health per point of vitality. But that's in flat health then. So um, I don't know if this really does much, the so 5-point bonus. Maybe I'm wrong here, and you can tell me below. But uh, the increased health percentage base, that's kind of crazy. So we definitely see here what they're trying to do. They're trying to get rid of everything ward-based and actually trying to make more health-based builds viable or stronger, just just straight health without any sort of um, stuff on top of it. So I like that because it's all just vault right now. We'll see how this pans out. I like it that they're going this direction. So we'll see uh, what comes from that. Um, how about the incoming server overload in cycle two? Are we better sit in cycle one? Yeah, yeah, much better. Um, We have a different, different, server, different server provider and different backend infrastructure and different matchmaking server uh, and different... It's, it's so, so much has changed. That's actually kind of crazy. Um, you know, right, the launch of 1.0 was a shit show pretty much because it was pretty much impossible to play the game. Um, so they just filed whoever was doing the service before that. I kind of like that. That's kind of a nice move. It's just you fucked up. Get out of here. So completely new servers, completely new matchmaking, everything new, backend new. So I hope the servers can take the load. 
we don't know how many players will actually come back in July, right? The 9th, when the new thing launches, the new patch launches. Um, people are talking about 200,000 people again, maybe even more than that because of the pinnacle balls and all that. All the great streamers or the big streamers will be coming back for sure. That will also lure in a lot of people. We will see how it does. Uh, definitely great to hear that the servers are hopefully <laughs> up to par this time. Apparently there was a bug in the software last time. So I don't know if switching the servers actually did something here, but they fixed it. So we'll see. We'll just see how it does. But I wanted to add this in because it's obviously important. All right. Uh, aren't you guys afraid of the long time it's taking to drop the next big patch and people losing interest in the game? I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a concern that we are... Um, that we that we weighed heavily when we decided um, on the time frame for the patch. It's it's two weeks longer than than um, what our our goal was, which isn't you know it's not great. It's not the end of the world. Um, I think that a um, an undercooked patch um, that people um, didn't like but had it quickly would be worse than a. Uh, um, like delivering on the quality that we need. This is a key thing, really, um, because quality over quantity always, right? And making sure the quality is there is rare these days. You know it yourself. Every one of us, we always talk shit with unfinished games being developed or like um, released, right? And now that they're actually taking a different approach and postponing the, the release a little bit, but to make sure the game is good, people are calling shit again. <laughs> It's interesting, like if you think back in the days when gaming was actually really good, except for the few exceptions these days, um, we waited years, right? There was games that were postponed the whole year because they couldn't finish it in time. And we waited that eagerly to, to get that game on our hands. And these days, if it's not like every three weeks there's new content, people are all mad about it. And I blame social media for that because like the attention span is so low with people. Now... This is one side of it. The other side is, I notice it myself. I think, I actually think these two extra weeks are a little bit, slightly too much for many people. I'm not saying they will not come back, but it's like, here's an example, right? I was doing, ever since 1.0 launched, I've been consistently only streaming Last Epoch and no other game. Up until... Last week, where I just had a, a short stint with Soma, which is a horror survival game, right? And tomorrow I'll actually be streaming. Actually, when you see this video, I'm already streaming it right in that moment. <laughs> I'll be streaming Diablo 4 for the first time in my life ever. Because even though I made so many last epoch builds, at this point I really got bored with it. I'm still going to stream the game, um, because I still want to make a build before the patch even launches that can do the pinnacle boss. I'm thinking of something that can easily take tier four Jura. That should be enough for the boss, I guess. That isn't broken, by the way, so no healing hand shenanigans. Something that is unlikely to be changed too much. So, um, so I'm still interested in the game, absolutely. But it just got very stale, even for me, who really enjoys this on a deep level. And you can tell by the player numbers, they're really low. Now I'm sure all the new stuff that is coming will keep us or will bring us all back and will, I'm going to be streaming this game only and drop Diablo 4 again, I'm sure. But I, right now it feels so bad. It feels so bad. And like if it would be two weeks earlier, not postpone these extra two weeks they took there, and then you will, you will, like we would already be in the hype week, right? Because that would be already coming out in like next week then. I think, something like that. So this week will already be everything being built up. Hype is coming. New things being released on a faster pace. <sighs> Maybe I'm just a bit weird that it's just these two extra weeks. Maybe they don't do shit. Um, I can definitely tell by the viewership that is way down. When I stream in morning times last epoch, there's like 10 viewers on Twitch. 10. <laughs> um, that's crazy. But yeah, I'm sure it will come back. Absolutely. I am no, no worries about this because I said before many times, RPGs are cyclical. So this happens all the time. It drops for any other game as well. Um, and then they come back. But yeah, um, I see both sides here. This is what I am, sort of the conclusion I come with this. I totally see why you would rather postpone two weeks to actually get the quality you want, 
But I also see why people are starting to feel like, ah, is this game dead or whatever? Because it's taking so long after the release. Um, especially because there's not even slight balance patches right now. Not even, there's like nothing. The Discord is completely void of anything. Um, just a little bit, maybe a server update it isn't even uh, like announced in the Discord. There's just nothing, absolutely nothing, except for these streams by Mike themselves once a week where he drops the teasers. That's it. So it feels bad. I totally get it, but I can, again, understand both sides. So I wanted to, to bring this up because I think it's an important topic. Let me know what you think of this. Do you think these extra two weeks really did some damage? Do you think it doesn't matter at all? We'll all be going crazy about the game on July 9th. Let me know below what you think. Did you jump to other games already? Are you still grinding last epoch? Um, oh yeah, and if you play Diablo 4, make sure while you watch this video, or after it rather, right now, to go on live, the live tab on YouTube or on Twitch and tell me how Diablo 4 is played because I have no idea. And I intentionally don't look at any guides. I just want to figure it out myself with maybe help from you. So I will see you there. And until then, have a good time with last epoch.